two armies stood between Hero and Rome. Let's not keep them waiting. Men, this battle is inevitable, but victory hangs in the balance. Act like sons of Achilles, and victory will be within your grasp. A truly suitable and inspiring speech for what would become a historical moment in time. The two armies meet in the centre of the open field, and the Cretans go to do what they do best. With panicked cries, the front line of the Roman Senate's army was quick to fall. As the Greeks shifted forward for the Cretans to reach the back ranks of the Romans, the army of Rome arrived. Hero would have to move quickly if he were to be fully ready for the second wave. The Romans let their missile units get too far ahead, and taking advantage of this, Hero charges in, the reinforcements steadily marching closer, their presence like a slow, falling executioner's axe. Hero engages the Velites, and the Romans, spurred by Hero's actions, broke rank and raced towards the Greek front line. The Velite did not last long against Hero. With his job done, Hero falls back to the safety of his Spartans. The Roman infantry are able to take down some of the Spartans with their peeler as they bumble around on the spot, being perfect sitting ducks for the Cretans. The reinforcements are almost here, and the Romans try to flank the Spartans. The Spartans are quick to react and turn to face the Triarii and Principe that face them. The Romans were clearly still no match for them. In the meantime, Lentulus, despite the fact that it was wildly discouraged at this point, charges into the Spartans. Hero was making his way round to work on flanking the remaining Romans, but with Lentulus breaking heart and running, the rest of the army was sent flying back to Rome. Seeing the failings of his main force, Marcus Maxentius turned his force back to Rome, readying himself for the inevitable Greek invasion. All that was left to do was deploy the cleanup crew. At 23 denarii ahead, you would be a fool not to invest in them. Get your Greek cavalry cleanup crew yours today, 999 denarii a week. Hero and his cavalry chased after the Roman force, the reinforcements had long since made it back to the city, cutting down each soldier until none remained. Lentulus made it back to Rome with less than 200 of his men, and Hero had suffered barely a scratch. The armies of Rome retreat into the city, and Hero begins the siege. Glorious victory! My lord, prepare for While the gates may have been open, the defences would still be active. It would be best to wait for the completion of the siege towers. The siege, In the transition of winter to summer, the Gaul finally attacks Salona. With four rams and an over 2,000 men number advantage, it wasn't going to end well for the Illyrian mercenaries. Maybe a good day to die, but it is a better one to live through. Yeah, let's not get too ahead of ourselves there, matey. The mercenaries are stretched out across the front wall. All they could hope for would be to take down as many as the Gaul as they could before they themselves fall. The rams make it into their positions, the gates is soon broken open, the walls fall in shortly. Out of javelins, the Illyrians charge through the breaches at the awaiting warband. The Gaul forced their way through, crushing into the mercenaries, and just as quickly as it began, the battle was over. A clear, but inevitable defeat. That is, until the game crashes. One auto-resolved battle later, and fate does not change, though the AI was able to take down an extra 150 Gaul. But, once more, Salona belonged to the Gaul. We would come back for it, but we had other, more important goals at this moment. Of course, now that we had their boss's capital under siege, the Romans wanted to negotiate peace. The Julii diplomat was presented before Aristonitos in Bylazora with a generous offer of a ceasefire for a payment of 12,000 denarii. Aristonitos just laughed. <laughs> you clearly don't understand how this works. He had the diplomat promptly escorted out. Once more, and likely not the last time, pirates sink another good Greek fleet. 
With Rome now out of bounds, Damastor moves on to the remaining Romans on the Italian peninsula. Taking on the faction leader now is probably a bit ambitious. Now Quintus Julius, on the other hand, would have to wait until winter. Back with Bailazora, the Thracians had brought a new army to the border. Was there to be a third rematch? Never mind that though, we had some Imperial Eagles to crush. The gates had remained open. Good. Their defences would be further spread. Let's not keep them waiting for their deaths. Today, we look for a victory worthy of Hercules himself. This is a mighty task, but we are men enough to do it! We go now to a bloody business! With another monumental speech from Hero, this bloody business could now begin, and the streets of Rome would no doubt be flowing with the streams of Roman blood by the end of this day. A singular siege tower is split off and assigned a small team. The rest of the army is moved to the other side of the city to keep a majority of the Roman force focused on them and not the actual besieging army. The battle officially starts and the plan was a success. The Romans had fallen for the distraction and were on the complete wrong side of the huge city. The siege tower made it to the walls without any disturbances. With the tower in position and the Spartans ready to scale onto the wall, the second phase of the plan could begin. The rest of the Spartans and Cretans were ready to be moved over to the city entrance that would shortly be secured and they would be able to march right onto the plaza without much resistance. Hero, the cavalry and the two manned towers would remain behind to keep up the pretense. Triarii were all that guarded the entry point and with the gate now under Greek control they wouldn't be standing for much longer. The Triarii started to retreat and there was no movement from the main Roman force. Excellent things were going according to plan. The main Greek force had finally made it over and the invasion of Rome could now commence. The Spartans entered the city first, momentarily admiring the city of marble. They would have time to suitably admire the city once it was theirs. The Triarii tried to stop the flow of Spartans, but the inferior spearmen had no chance against the elite Spartans. And with the combination of their own walls firing down on them and the overwhelming number of troops entering through the gate, the Roman spearmen broke and ran. The Spartans followed the fleeing men down the side alley, and soon enough the centre of Rome came into view. The Spartans fired into the small street, and the Cretans weren't too far behind. Meanwhile, outside the city walls, Team Diversion had a lovely view of the walls of Rome. Deep down, some of the Spartans felt a little disappointed that they weren't in the city, but Hero was there to remind them that they were doing a very important job just standing there and enjoying the view. Back inside, the Spartans were ready for the final showdown, and the Cretans lined up behind them. Damn it, they were out of range! And so the Spartans marched further down the street as one large red and gold mass. Now in position, the Spartans then spread out, or at least tried to spread out. Punching into the wall didn't seem to work, so some placed their unit sideways, exposing their weak side to the Roman generals just down the street. Realising their mistake, they right themselves, although some, bored waiting for their fellow Spartans to get in line, go for a small tour of the city. With the Spartans finally in position, the Cretans move up, though they are still out of range. Another shuffle forward and the archers can reach the generals. The attack order is given and the archers fire down on the Romans, but aren't able to draw him over. Another shuffle through the streets it was then. Now at the mouth, there was no way the archers could miss. The Cretans' arrows come falling from the sky, sending the Roman generals into a hurried panic. But eventually, they get drawn over to the Spartans. The Spartans found there was just something satisfying about watching cavalry mount away at the end of their spears. Roman leader was a tough one to kill, but through Spartan might and steel, the man is proven mortal and is slain by Greek strength. Eager to avenge their fallen leader, the dogs of war are set loose and the Princope charge into the Spartans.
but remains of Marcus's bodyguard prowled down the street before once more charging into the Spartans. What remained of the infantry was quickly cut down and all that was left to defend the plaza and Rome herself were the remaining two generals. Both of whom find the end of their fates at the end of Spartan Spears. With Rome now under Greek possession, the rest of the Roman army mobilises to try and reclaim their city before it was too late. A unit of Equitate tries to return to the centre, but run right into a unit of Spartans that had hung back exactly for this situation. The cavalry do not fare well against the spearmen and break, pushing through the Spartans, knocking down some Cretans in their panicked movements. With the plaza secured, and with only one more entrance to the square, the Spartans are quick to go and secure the second street. The Romans had left their posts on the wall and had been racing through the streets to reclaim their city, but it would be too late. Three units of Spartans backed by Cretans with full ammunition reserves blocked the way, and with two minutes remaining it wasn't looking good for the Romans. The Romans tried to push through, but it was like fighting a war. Three Spartans had fallen, whereas they had completely gone. 30 seconds remained, and the last remaining Roman infantry came rushing in. Making contact with the Spartan spears, they fell even before making it within arm's length of the Greeks. With an impassable wall of Spartans and arrows flying down from above, the Romans are quick to break. Hero takes pity on the Romans when the call for surrender is given. The Romans would get to live on knowing that they failed to defend Rome and her peoples. The Roman people were a proud one and would never bend to Greek rulership, and so another 20,000 people would join the bodies in the bloody streets. And the Roman Senate were no more. Only two of her families remained, and if the Scipii were smart, they would stay on Sicily. Eretium was next on the list of cities, and spies are moved into position. Ah, they had the plague! Excellent! Perhaps this time we'll have a little more luck weaponizing the disease. Ereminum looked like it needed a good depopulation. Summer turns to winter, and of course there is a forgotten diplomat wandering through Gaul. Though, the Scipii didn't seem to get the message at Rome and attack Croton. To the northeast of the Empire, the Phrasians have yet to make a move. Ariminum is infected with the plague. Merry Christmas! Love the Greeks! Of course, we couldn't leave the Gaul out of this festive gift-giving time, so Panatius makes his way north. Finally making it to the city, Damastor takes out Quintus before the plague does the job for him. He too then makes his way north. Telemacho is moved into Eretium. As soon as the plague was gone, Hero would make his move. Back in the old Brutii cities, it was time for Aeonestos to prove himself to his father. Taking a selection of troops, Hero's youngest moves south to reinforce Croton and hopefully paint a clearer message to the Romans. The Greeks had the advantage of numbers, but the Scipii had brought with them Ballista. Though with some fine cavalry manoeuvres, they shouldn't be too much of a problem. The Greeks had the uphill advantage, and with the reinforcements from Croton coming from behind, the Romans were surrounded. The battle begins and the cavalry are immediately deployed on either side of the Romans' line, ready to flank the squishy behind. The militia cavalry are the first to arrive and start firing down on the ballista crews. The rest of the Roman infantry appeared fixated on Aeonestos' presence, racing towards him and his guard. Through careful manoeuvring, Aeonestos was able to separate the town guard that was acting as the commanding unit away from the rest, dealing a good chunk of damage against them. Tired of being harassed, the Romans call for the retreat directly towards the army of Croton. The Greeks of Croton ready themselves for the wave of Romans coming their way. 
As the Croton archers picked off those who approached, Aemnestos continued to chip away at the backs of the Romans as they ran. Coming into contact with the armoured hoplites and being charged into by hundreds of peasants was enough to break the Roman spirit. And with the last few units broken, all that was left was to mop up the remaining Romans left on the field. The captain was one of the last to go down, and Aeonestos wins his first victory, something his older siblings had yet to do. He returns home to Tarentum with an understanding of strategy. Another year comes to its end, and the Thracians approach Hero with an offer. For a measly 10,880 denarii, they would give us the honour of a ceasefire, stating it was time to end the bloodshed. Hero just laughed at the diplomat. The Greeks had already paid them off once, and while it wasn't like Bylazora hadn't been able to repel their pathetic attempts before, the offer is denied and the diplomat very quickly shown out of the Roman palace. At any rate, the Thracian army had moved, and it appeared to have gone home to Tylus. We would have to keep an eye on them. After a brief rest, Hero is ready to move on, but these Roman cities truly were fussy and were not content for the man to leave just yet. Perhaps when proper Greek infrastructure was introduced, Hero can get on with capturing the rest of Italy. In the meantime, Telemacho helps spread the plague between the Julii cities, making a quick stop at the seaside city of Segestica before moving north to skip out Mediolonium. Demestor returns south to take out more Julii leaders. Gaius Julius was to be his next target, but the sneaky Marcus Julius gets in the way. Demastor does not like people who get in his way. Oh dear, it appears that Marcus will no longer be a problem. And look at that, Demastor is now quite the expert. A little north, Theothrastos continues to sate his lust for gore blood, and poor Bellinus just so happened to be stood there. It was the original plague-bearing spies time to move. With a 22% chance of even getting into the city, never mind the fact it was rioting, Mediolonium was a no-go. Patavium, on the other hand... Merry Christmas in July! Enjoy your plague! The surrounding Dacian settlements would no doubt benefit from some nice plague too. The summer turns back to winter and the Julii think that they can take on our fleets. Admiral Dion quickly proves otherwise. A new suitor is presented, but with Drillmaster being at the top of his traits, he is immediately rejected. In the Tyrrhenian Sea, just off the coast of Masana, the Scipii think they can transport troops. Admiral Dion is swift to show the Scipii what the Greeks think of transport fleets. Unfortunately, a transport fleet does make landfall, but Dion ensures that they can't escape. To the north of Apollonia, a Gaul army had appeared just over the border. It appeared that the other two Sparta siblings would have their moment of glory in the near future. Not too much could be gleaned from the Scipii army that had landed, only that it was a troublesome one. Well, Telemacho had a marginally better chance at getting into Mediolonium, his skills would be better put to use, opening the gates of Eretium when the time came. Demastor tries to take down Gaius Julius once more, only to be blocked by yet another hidden Julii army. Now this was getting ridiculous. While Demastor composed himself, Theothrastos scoped out his next target, and our spy introduced Segestica to the wonderful world of plague and moves on for Salona. Herennius Julius was in Damastor's way, and so he too shall die. Having observed his target for long enough, Theothrastus strikes, taking Cassiovolanus down with ease. At last, Eretium was plague free, and it was time for Telemacho to get into position. My lord, searching for clues. And with several more peasants ready to fill in the position, Hero is finally able to leave Rome and begin the march into Julii land. But he is just out of reach of besieging the city. The winter comes to its end and in the east a diplomat moves north to have a look at Byzantium. The Thracians had to be up to something. In Italy, the large Scipii army attacks Croton. 
the Gaul attack Apollonia, and the Julii still think that they come best after a Dion. At the very least, we have a young 16-year-old join the family. Hey there guys, I just wanted to give a huge thank you to everyone who has subscribed this week. The response has been absolutely incredible. And I'd like to give an even more special thanks to Flying Pig, Strategy Joe and Storm and Norman 64 Thank you all again so much and I'll see you next time. Bye!